So at the beginning of the Summa Contra Gentiles, Thomas Aquinas says that we must, uh, I have it, okay, we must first show what way is open to us in order that we may make known the truth which is our object. To question ourselves in this way is to do what we today call epistemology. So in my opinion, in the first chapters of the Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas examines questions belonging to the so-called epistemology of religious beliefs. Aquinas wonders how we may have the right to claim that God exists and what his attributes are, and to believe the revealed truth. So understood, epistemology of religious beliefs is part of what I call, what I will call, intellectual ethics. It is less about beliefs themselves, to know whether or not they are justified, than about believers, that is to say about persons and their intellectual virtues. Is it possible to receive truth from the divine external source and donor through the biblical text itself, or even through those who are purportedly in charge of manifesting the word of God and be an epistemologically virtuous, irreproachable person? My hypothesis, it is written on the slide, my hypothesis is that the opening chapters of the Summa Contra Gentiles may be viewed as a step into the field of intellectual ethics, examining the acquisition of religious beliefs from the perspective of intellectual virtue and defending the legitimacy of certain intellectual attitudes. Let us distinguish two accounts of epistemology. What we may call, what we may call an epistemology of justification deals with the norms or rules whose observance ensures the justification of our beliefs and the legitimacy of our claims to knowledge. Such an epistemology likewise concerns itself with the reflective control that we exert over our beliefs. In the second account, epistemology explores intellectual virtues as quality of character. Our epistemic, our epistemic life is laudable when our acquisition of beliefs depends upon these virtues. However, in the perspective that we find in Aquinas, virtues are not understood simply as skills or competences that ensure that we arrive at beliefs that are justified by evidence. So the second account of which I speak here differs from the so-called virtue realabilism for which ultimately Virtues are simply faculties functioning properly for the maximization of our knowledge. An epistemology of intellectual virtues in a Thomistic approach addresses the question of what a good epistemic life is. So it is not intended to define justification or knowledge to indicate what are the right rules as in an epistemology of justification for regulating beliefs or even not what are the right procedures as in an epistemology of skills to acquire beliefs. In epistemology of the first type, the main epistemic commandment to persons is to believe only on the basis of sufficient evidence. It is essential that, that this evidence be recognized internally through an examination of the reasons to believe. 
any defense of the legitimacy of revealed beliefs or of any claim to know through revelation will prove on this basis utterly implausible and so epistemically blameworthy. Revealed beliefs suppose our complete intellectual dependence upon an external source. We are not in the position to exert any internal regulation. The standard of such regulation would itself be received from the same source and not grounded in our epistemological initiative. So in modern epistemology, the primacy of the rule of evidence has led to religious beliefs being deemed to be intrinsically irrational. As I read the first nine chapters of the Summa Contra Gentiles, St. Thomas offers, as I have indicated, another epistemology close to that which I presented above as the second type an epistemology framed in terms of intellectual virtues. Our beliefs that God exists and in divine revelation presupposes that there is an appropriate mode of apprehending the gospel truth, which is not governed by the rule of evidence, but which is, however, fully legitimate from an epistemological point of view. In order to appreciate this, we would have to highlight an epistemology based upon the value of certain virtue, virtuous epistemic attitudes and not upon epistemic norms that are independent of people and of who these people are. The canonical formulation of the evidentialist principle was given by William Clifford it is wrong, always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. So it is required of the believer to prove that he maintains his beliefs without his judgment being vitiated, which can only consist of putting forward convincing arguments or evidence in their favor. But the religious believer, because his judgment is vitiated by his belief, is quite incapable of that. So the religious believer is morally blameworthy. Shame on him. The reason for this condemnation is that the religious believer arrives at a proposition represented as true by his own intellectual means. Therefore, no truth is actually given there is no evidence for that proposition. And especially no truth results from a grace given to creatures who receive it directly, the apostles in the gospel or those who heard the sermon on the mount, for example, or through testimony, for instance, those who hear and read the gospel. To show that proper epistemic control exerted on our beliefs is incompatible with the immediate revelation of a truth, it is possible to argue in the following way. Suppose this rule, accept as true any proposition that is revealed. This would assume a distinctly human capacity to identify a proposition as revealed, a standard of authentic revelation. This standard could be, for example, the recognized status of the one who claims this truth. He is a prophet. He is the son of God. He speaks with the authority of the, of the Orthodox Church. But to be plausible, this standard itself presupposes that the rule of evidence has been respected. For example, that if someone speaks in the name of God, his entitlement to do so must be supported by sufficient evidence. Evidence may not itself be a revealed truth. So an unrevealed truth acquired according to the rule of evidence is necessarily the condition of acceptance of any revealed truth. 
that we must have evidence in favor of this uh, standard, of the standard according to which a proposition is revealed, shows that it is not enough that it is claimed to be revealed, to be accepted as such. It is acceptable as revealed, and thus as a truth, only on the basis of evidence in which revelation necessarily plays no role. In the following uh, two quotations, Locke, John Locke, appears to me to be reasoning in the manner just described. And I will not read the text. Uh, they are very well known, in fact. Modern justificatory epistemology, as exemplified here in Locke's comments on revelation, is then incompatible with the straightforward possibility of revealed truth taken at face value. Revealed truth as always to satisfy a standard of belief, to validate them. And this standard must be independent of all revealed origin. Its source is in our own ability of evidential regulation. The only possibility for the Christian believer would be to believe without or even against pertinent evidence. For to be a Christian, you have to recognize certain revealed truths as revealed and known as truths in the name of God because they are revealed. You have then to believe them true without satisfying the rule of evidence. This is not optional or accidental for a Christian. It seems even to be constitutive of Christian faith. If modern epistemology cannot tolerate such a mode of access to truth through revelation, in certain cases merely because someone utters it, most especially if that someone is Jesus Christ or God himself, then there are three, possi three possibilities. We have to renounce Christianity in the name of evidentialism. We have to reject evidential, evidentialism in the name of Christianity. We must be fideist. Concerning the, the second solution, the second possibility, it is if it is immoral to reject evidentialism, evidentialism as Clifford suggests, then to believe that the proposition is true because it is revealed without sufficient evidence in the authenticity of the revelation would be intellectually vicious. On such view, the second possibility, we have to reject evidentialism in the name of Christianity, would be a promotion of intellectual immorality. Well, does Thomas offer an argument that can respond to a critique of the epistemological irresponsibility and intellectual immorality of religious belief? In particular, can he dispute what is presented in modern times as the irresponsibility and immorality of the claim to have received the truth by revelation? Regarding divine things, Thomas distinguishes between two kinds of truths. Natural reason suffices for the first kind. Man comes by the sole effort of his reason to know that God exists and to know some of his properties, eternity, materiality, simplicity, perfection, goodness, uniqueness, infinity, omniscience. The other sort of truth, I quote uh, Aquinas, go beyond any enterprise of reason. One of the examples given by Thomas is that God is trillion and one, so the Trinity. The epistemological doctrine is so summarized, quote, there are therefore in God intelligible truths which are accessible to human reason, 
that there are others which absolutely exceed its force. So all truths are in God. Some are accessible by reason, others only by revelation. There are said to be two kinds of truths, only in the sense of there being truths that we apprehend in two different ways. Truth itself is the same in both cases. Thus, truth in metaphysics and rational theology, on the one hand, and in revelation and revealed theology, on the other, is truth in one and the same sense. As Thomas puts it, I say two kinds, I say two kinds of truths in divine things, placing myself not on the side of God with the one and simple truth, but on the side of our knowledge, which relates to various ways to divine realities. The truth of metaphysics and rational theology may be demonstrated against a reasoning opponent. Let us suppose he denies the existence of God or that he questions his eternity. Reason can be persuasive against such denials by means of arguments in good standing. By contrast, in the truth of revelation and revealed theology, the doubter recognizes the authority of sacred scripture and the way to convince him lies in demonstrating which truths are actually revealed. Thus, as Thomas says, the difference between the two kinds of truths does not exist on God's side. It is a difference that concerns our intellectual debate. First, it concerns the way in which we can apprehend truth. Second, it concerns how we can defend truth. And third, we must also consider the opponent, the opponent against whom one defends truth. Is it someone who does not recognize the authority of the Old Testament, an unbeliever, or someone who does not accept some tr religious truth, but who nevertheless shares a large part of the Bible, for instance, the Old Testament, with Christians, recognizing its authority? So we have uh, at least three possibilities, three kind of persons. That Christians' philosophers are able to apprehend certain important religious truths by natural reason makes them different from those who are unable even to understand the arguments of rational theology. Christian philosophers are also importantly different from those who might be able to understand truth, but who are deprived of the time necessary for metaphysical speculation, being too much busy with temporal affairs. Some others who might have time are simply lazy because one needs intellectual drive to apply your reason to difficult metaphysical and theological matters. Acquiring those religious truths that reason can bring us to presuppose us certain virtues, to presuppose certain virtues, both intellectual and moral. It is these human qualities that are called upon in the contemplative life. This is why the Summa Contragetiles opens with this quote, my moth shall meditate truth and my lips shall hate impiety. The, uh, it's a quotation of the Proverbs. The examination of truth commensurate with reason as opposed to the acceptance of truth only in the name of God is thus a matter of wisdom. The speculative courage 
that moves one to one to look for reasons for fundamental truths about divine things is exactly what underpins the best life, the life of contemplation, for being such as we are. Concerning the truths to which reason cannot lead us, one also needs a spiritual effort sustained by the virtues of the mind. It requires a disposition to hear the voice of God, mainly in the Old and New Testaments, and the virtue of trust, which without which one can learn nothing through testimony. Why is the first chapter of the Summa Contra, uh, Contra Gentiles devoted to the, to the office of the wise man, as it is said? It is because we have to determine how the desire to know divine things is to be ordered, conducted in the best way. This is typically a matter of intellectual ethics. For some truths, the desire must be ordered by the virtues of wisdom, knowledge of the highest causes of reality, by the virtue of science, systematic demonstrative knowledge, and by the virtue of understanding, capacity to grasp the first principles of, of demonstration. For certain other truths, the desire must be ordered by the welcoming of revelation and testimony through an appropriate relationship with the sacred scripture. Other virtues are called upon as well, an, under, an understanding which supposes the virtue of studiousness as a part of the virtue of temperance. It supposes also the capacity to listen to the word of God and the love of truth, which is yet another virtue. The truth that we access by reason and by listening to the word are equally gifts of God. The difference between them is epistemological, not ontological. Our ways of apprehending truth are linked to our intellectual attitudes, which are in part related to our social lives. Do we have the time needed to pursue wisdom and to discern the word of God? Do we have the virtues of mind that make us sensible to the gift of the Holy Spirit without which the reasons for faith and even what one should believe in faith, which is revealed, would escape us? An objection to my reading of the Summa Contra Gentiles would be that my interpretation takes us quite far from the letter of the text. In the first three parts of the Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas discusses arguments whose merits must be regulated, but he says nothing about the virtues to be exercised in this operation. And in the fourth part, where it discusses truths that reason cannot itself account for, reveal truth, it does not present this as a question of virtues. But let us take a closer look. Thomas affirms, as I have already said, that in the first place, the truth about God to which natural reason arrives are offered to men as objects of faith. And in the second place, that the truth which reason reaches are not of a nature different from those that are revealed. It is the modality of access that differs, as we noted earlier. Therefore, the philosopher, when he accepts the first truth, does not normally depend upon controlling his judgment antecedently through rational argument. He does not await the arguments of reason about the truth to be believed. It was the same for Bertrand Russell. He did not wait until he had finished Principia Mathematica to believe that two and two uh, means uh, four. He believed it and later offered an account of the legitimacy of, of his belief. The philosopher does not have to summon the truth about the things of God to appear before before of the tribunal of reason. 
his job is not to determine whether we have the right to have the beliefs that we hold. He's not looking for the data that might lead led him to say to God, well, that's credible. I can accept to believe that. The philosopher received a supernatural inspiration, as Aquinas says. He does not entertain faith while he aims to justify it on the basis of arguments. On the contrary, he argues from faith. That is a venerable tradition of fides querens intellectum and credo ut intelligam inherited from St. Augustine and St. Anselm. The legitimacy of our beliefs, of our belief in the truth of the faith, and our assurance of knowing them do not therefore rest on the prerequisite of epistemological regulation. Rather, it presupposes a triply appropriate intellectual attitude. First, appropriate to what, to who we are, rational beings who perfect themselves in their intellectual life. Second, appropriate to the kind of truth to be known, whether or not they can be attained by reason. Thirdly, appropriate to interlocutors according to whether they share or name with us the sacred text and whether they share it in part or not at all. At the start, at the start of the Summa Contra Gentiles, Thomas in no way proposes a set of epistemological rules to be observed in the inquiry. What he proposes to, does not resemble at all Descartes' rule for the direction of the mind or the discourse on the method. There are no rules, principle, deontological claims, but Aquinas makes explicit the conditions of intellectual ethics about divine things and God as truth. He describes the kind of attitude, wisdom, that should be adopted. We must not, not to be boorish. We have to move away from occupations that would distract us from the contemplative life. We have to overcome laziness, or what he also calls in the Summa Theologiae, asedia. There he says that spiritual good is a good of every truth. Sorrow about spiritual good is evil in itself. We have not to walk as also the gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, says Aquinas by quoting the epistle, the epistle to the Ephesian. We have to have to be wise, and it is possible only by receiving the gift of wisdom. Those who enter into the inquiry realize in the virtue of studiousness the nature which includes a natural desire to understand and to know. This studious inquiry, therefore, does not aim to justify Christian belief or to ground them rationally as if such truths were waiting to be justified and granted by us. Inquiry correctly managed make us better through understanding our humans, but that is because of the character of the truth we thereby gain access to. The very exercise of reason is so difficult in dealing with such truths that we would never comprehend their rational support without starting from them as something given to us. I may now borrow, borrow a distinction made by Roderick Schizom that between Methodist epistemology and particularist epistemology, although I use it in my own way and not in Schizom's way, the Methodist epistemology asserts that determining what we are warranted in believing or claiming to know presupposes a prior formulation of epistemic criteria or rules. Beliefs 
satisfying the prescribed criteria or satisfying the defined rules are justified. This epistemology is ambitious. We can discover all the genuine epistemic and cognitive contents that enters our minds by method methodically following these rules. The particularist epistemology is modest. By examining our beliefs, we can make the norms of their rationality explicit. We are rational by nature, even though we are fable, because our reason is weak, especially when it comes to divine things that lie so far beyond it. But this does not mean that the alleged belief and knowledge concerning divine things are illegitimate until they are brought before the tribunal of reason. Beliefs are legitimate as long as nothing militates evilly against them. In that case, it would be intellectually vicious to, present, uh, to pretend they are innocent. We must reject a belief because it is wrong, not because it does not satisfy a principle such as Clifford's or meet certain other deontological requirements. What matters then in the formation of belief is a virtue like the desire of truth and what could also be called an epistemic sensibility. So she's on distinguish two questions, A and B. What do we know? What is the extent of our knowledge? B, how are we to decide whether we know what are the criteria of knowledge? And he says, going back to our question A and B, we may summarize three possible views as follows. There is skepticism. You cannot answer either question without presupposing an answer to the other. And therefore, the questions cannot be answered at all. There is methodism. You begin with an answer to B. And there is particularism. You begin with an answer to A. I suggest that the third possibility is the most reasonable, says uh, Shizol. In my opinion, Thomas is particularist. He adopts an epistemology which, starting from beliefs, examines the reasons we have for having them but does not search for their justification according to some philosophically mandated epistemic criteria. There is not a kind of epistemic extraterritoriality of the philosopher in charge of regulating the warrant for beliefs in terms of his own formulas for rational justification. This attitude of Descartes, of Descartes, Locke, and the majority of modern philosophers is not accepted by Aquinas in connection with religious beliefs. Thomas indicates that some men at the very beginnings of Christianity were so divinely inspired, I quote, that simple and untutored persons filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit come to possess instantaneously the highest wisdom and the readiest eloquence. They are followed without the violent assault of arms or the promise of pleasures and what is most wonderful of all in the midst of the tyranny of the persecutor by an innumerable throng of people, both simple and must learned, who flocked to the Christian faith. It is a quotation of uh, the uh, Contra Gentiles book one, chapter six. This account of the formation of Christian beliefs by the intervention of the Holy Spirit would certainly not satisfy the Methodist and Evidentialist epistemologist. But Thomas, being a particularist, is humble even concerning such beliefs. 
which are not guilty before the tribunal of reason, even if uh, before the tribunal of reason, even if they are they have not been shown to satisfy some externally specified epistemological criteria. Aquinas intends to show that the Christian does not believe absurdities and is not epistemologically guilty when he claims, when the Christian claims to have received revealed truth. What is needed for receiving such truth by a rational creature with a, a brave, simple person or one of the wise is simply intellectually virtuous attitudes, which are for Aquinas simply commonsensical. But could it not could it not be objected that as is interpreted here, Aquinas chooses a convenient epistemology at will, because it helps it helps him to justify unjustifiable beliefs. Would it not greatly facilitate the task in the epistemology of religious beliefs to resort, as Aquinas does, to the so-called epistemology of virtues. Isn't this simply a way of ensuring at little epistemological expense and over, an overly easy path to purported knowledge? I don't think so, because for Thomas, as I tried to explain, Christian beliefs don't wait for reasons to maintain them. Christian faith is even by its very nature a reason to be confident in our rationality. The truths of natural reason are, are not opposed to the truths of the Christian faith. Faith as virtue is the fullest realization of our nature, that is, of our rationality. This is why certain divine truths can be reached by reason, and also why we don't stop being rational beings or stop living fully rational lives when we confidently receive the gift of revelation. The work of the sage is therefore on this account to make explicit the two kinds of truths which are given. It is not to set up like the modern philosopher criteria which would be the epistemological preconditions of truth. If we read Aquinas as starting from the modern epistemological project, we misunderstand him radically. And we also see only shortcomings. Thomas says, and so, in the name of the divine mercy, I have the confidence to embark upon the work of a wise man, even though this may surpass my powers, and I have set myself the task of making known, as far as my limited powers will allow, the truth that the Catholic faith professes, and of setting aside the errors that are opposed to it. To use the word of Hillary, I am aware that I hope this to God as the chief duty of my life, that my every word and sense may speak of him. Unacceptable as it may be to moderns, it is crucial to understand that Aquinas is speaking from the truth. He receives it and meditates on it in two ways, by argument in the first three books of the Summa Contra Gentiles, and by interpretation in the fourth book. It is not a question of exercising control according to epistemological standards that the, philosophers, that the philosopher establishes according to an ethics of control, but of, of affording the truth according to an ethics of intellectual virtues. The only method for truth is to live a good intellectual life whereby we realize, we realize our rational nature at its best. 
in Aquinas religious epistemology, I quote uh, Aquinas, no opinion or belief is implanted in man by God, which is contrary to man's natural knowledge. The difficulty for a contemporary reader of the initial three parts of the Summa Contra Gentiles and also of the first chapter of its fourth part is to free his mind as he re reads of the to, to free his mind of the epistemological model which has been dominant in modernity. Modern epistemology appeals as is, as is evident in Clifford to the notion of epistemic responsibility. We must be intellectual responsible for our beliefs. But the difference with Aquinas is that for him, epistemic responsibility is a matter of ordered receptivity to choose and therefore of epistemic particularism. It is not an a priori regulation of reasoning and therefore not a question of method in the sense of Descartes and his followers. The following passage from the once famous book by Father Certidiange, The Intellectual Life, indicates in flowery writing what is really a question for of what is really a question of for a Thomistic particularist. Responsiveness of the soul to the ineffable spring, its filial and loving dispositions lay it open to receive light after light and ever increasing favor and rectitude. Truth, when loved and realized as a life, shows itself to be a first principle one's vision is according to what one is, one participates in truth by the participating in the spirit through whom it exists. Thank you very much. Okay, Roger, I, so I'm getting some of my green screen is, is coming through here, screen. Uh, let's let's see if we have some questions and the sister uh, who's monitoring the the talk will ask the question for you I think that's how it work or else you could look at the comment boxes so we'll see if sister Thomas Miriam chimes in here go for it sister hello Roger okay hello. we've got one question from Parisia how does or would Thomas characterize modern theists oh yes to be as immoral, uh, sick, or oh, I, I, I suppose that uh, I, I don't think that Thomas Aquinas uh, have the occasion to meet someone like a modern artist for a lot of reasons. I'm not sure, si simply because uh, they are modern. So uh, these are tastes, so he had no occasion. But I suppose that perhaps he would, I think that they are in a sense immoral, intellectually immoral. Uh, it's not impossible. At least they are in a sense vicious, intellectually vicious. Uh, but perhaps also he, he, would, have, he would have seen something uh, not completely foreign to the idea of uh, Alvin Plantinga's uh, idea that uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, a noetic effect of the um, of the original scene is possible for to to characterize uh, atheism. I suppose that. Uh, it would have not been completely uh, foreign to this kind of ideas. And can intellectual virtues be reduced to moral virtues? Which ones? Well, clearly uh, Aquinas distinguishes between uh, intellectual virtues and, and moral virtues, of course. And, uh, but 
what he calls intellectual virtues for him uh, are simply good habits. But he, he says that uh, it would be possible for uh, someone very bad to have uh, good intellectual habits. So uh, intellectual virtues are not moral virtues for him. But perhaps uh, it is possible, I think so, I think it is possible to, uh, to show that uh, our ability to use intellectual habits is uh, as a moral character uh, and uh, a, ma a moral meaning uh, for us. So uh, even if in Thomas Aquinas, there is a strong distinction between intellectual uh, virtues and moral virtues, I think that we can construct a, a sort of Thomistic uh, account of uh, some intellectual virtues as uh, very important for a good intellectual life and good in a moral sense. Yes, Mats, if you want to. Yes, Matt? thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Oh, thank you for a, a very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering what you think about the role that natural knowledge of God plays for the morality of belief in revelation. So one way of thinking about it is to say that uh, because we have some natural knowledge of God, it's, we can responsibly believe uh, claims to div divine revelations. We can believe that the Bible is revealed because we have some prior knowledge of uh, of God from nature or something like that. So what would you say, would, could it, would it be virtuous to believe divine revelation or claims to divine revelation in the absence of some kind of natural knowledge of God? Or is, is, is natural knowledge of God a presupposition for some kind of responsible belief in, in revelation? But, yeah. Yes. Uh, of course, it depends if we separate uh, completely natural knowledge uh, of God and uh, the grace. So it's the question of the relation between natural knowledge and grace, which is a, a very difficult theological problem, uh, uh, as you know, certainly better than me. And, and uh, well, I would say that uh, in a sense, uh, In, in a good epistemic uh, life, in a virtuous uh, life, uh, in intellectual life, uh, what is, uh, what is, uh, what is exercised is a natural knowledge of God. I don't know if I, uh, uh, if uh, it is what uh, you wanted, uh, if I answer your question. Yeah, I, I was more thinking about uh, kind of propositional knowledge. Uh, for example, that we, we can see from nature that there must be creators, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that this kind of knowledge, even if it's, it, it need not be the result of argument, it can, can, could okay. be a result of, of, mm -hmm. of a perception. You can just see, ordinary people can see that yeah. Uh, uh, there is well, design, for instance. In this, in this case, I'm not sure that uh, Aquinas would be completely agree, because uh, in this case, he, it would mean something like uh, uh, Plantinga's uh, belief, uh, uh, basis belief. So uh, the idea would be that we have a sort of uh, basic belief in God, uh, simply, I look at the, uh, at the nature, uh, beautiful nature, and uh, immediately I believe in God. Uh, so this kind of, uh, of, uh, of ideas that, uh, which are 
defended by uh, Alvin Plantinga. But I'm not sure that uh, Aquinas would be agree with uh, with uh, this idea of uh, religious basic belief. Um, uh, it seems to me that the place he gives to natural theology and especially in the Summa Contra Gentiles, shows that he requires something more uh, argumentative, something which is more elaborated than simply basic beliefs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roger, there is another question from Purusha. It's, what? what is the proper role of apologetics in your view? Well, it, it would be very long <laughs> uh, to answer this question, but uh, well, uh, I think that in my view, apologetics is something, uh, I, I would say it's something negative uh, in, in the sense that uh, it's an effort to answer questions against religious beliefs. So to show that what is uh, said against is not uh, sufficient. And I am I think that it is exactly what uh, uh, Aquinas uh, tries, he, he tries to, to give in the uh, first, first three books of the Summa Contra Gentiles, a lot of arguments we can give to people uh, which, who are, uh, people who are uh, able to understand the, the arguments and to show that uh, we can answer uh, critics of uh, religious beliefs and especially the kind of religious belief of, uh, against Christian beliefs. So he, he, uh, the critic of uh, Christian beliefs can be answered. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Claudio. What is Thomas' view? Claudio, on? what is Thomas's view on objective truth? Uh, well, it would be it would be long also to answer. Uh, clearly, things that we are able to to uh, um, uh, we are able to know objective truth uh, and to know truths which are completely independent of. Uh, of us, uh, I would say absolute truth. Uh, or, so we are able, and, and the reason why we are able is that we are what we are, is that we are rational creatures. So, and, and certainly uh, our uh, resemblance to God play a, a, a very important uh, role in our capacity to, ability to, to be able to catch objective truth. I can answer also Gavin uh, Kerr. Uh, following Gavin would, up, yes, Gavin would like to ask his question out loud. Yes, following up on Matt's question, uh, you, you want to, to say your, you want to? Yeah, yeah, so maybe I'll just, you know, bring yeah. it up. So, it, um, do, do you think it's the case that, that, that for Thomas, one who is disposed to believe things about God on the basis of the infused virtue of faith, do you think that somebody who believes simply on the basis of that virtue um, has greater virtue than one who is disposed to believe on the basis of natural reason? So that will be, we would be in the odd situation that somebody who doesn't believe on the basis of all the metaphysics and the philosophy um, is actually of greater virtue and greater merit than one who does do all the philosophy and the metaphysics? I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, no, I don't think so, because as I have said, it's it's not two different truths you have to believe. It's the same truth. It's only, uh, it's only on our side that there is a difference. It's not on, the, on God's side that there is a difference. So, uh, uh, I don't think that, uh, well, uh, when, when you believe, uh, to, 
what you believe on the basis of natural reason, what you arrive at is perhaps a belief in God. It's, it's not faith in God. So uh, do you mean uh, your question? Is your question uh, the question to know if it is better to have faith than only uh, a belief uh, in God? Uh, surely, yes. <laughs> surely, yes. Uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, uh, even the, the demons uh, believe in God, of course, but they have no faith. So uh, it is surely better to have faith than simply to believe in God on the basis of natural reason. Okay, th thank you. Roger, we have a question from Tony. Tony, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yes, um, hello there. Um, yeah, um, I must uh, first uh, make an admission that I'm actually a lawyer rather than a philosopher, so I know I'm treading into a dangerous territory. Uh, but, but my question uh, relates to um, it's it's the evidence aspect that you um, were referring to, Roger. And um, it seems to me that uh, a modern man looking at uh, reading Thomas Aquinas would find um, his arguments very compelling um, because of the way that he combines reason and faith. And it may be that we're perhaps in a point in our history where faith has sort of like gone to the to the margins of our um, understanding of uh, knowledge. But in fact, if 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 Thomas could be reclaimed for the modern common man, uh, that would be a great virtue in itself. Perhaps you might be able to comment on that. <clears throat> Yes, surely, but uh, it seems to me that when someone, uh, by reading uh, Aquinas, is uh, begins to understand something of uh, uh, what to be a believer mean. Uh, Perhaps it, it's not simply the effect of Aquinas, uh, there is something else. So, uh, um, uh, well, sh surely, uh, if the question is to know if uh, Aquinas is uh, more appropriate to, uh, to modern mind, um, uh, Perhaps yes, but I'm not completely sure because uh, it seems to me, for example, uh, in, in France at, at least, uh, uh, today uh, Thomas Aquinas is perhaps not the most uh, 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 reputed or the most uh, important uh, theologian uh, taken into consideration. and. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure that the modern mind, the very res recent modern mind, is uh, uh, more attracted to, to, to Aquinas than uh, it was before. I'm not sure. <laughs> 